Investing with IBD is brought to you by Alliance Bernstein, a global investment manager offering active, flexible solutions across asset classes. ABS the tools and expertise investors need to get their portfolios ready to navigate late cycle investing. To find out more, visit abfunds.com. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD for May 15th, 2019. I'm your host, Arusha Pierce, and today we have a special guest. We have Mark Minervini, stock market wizard, successful growth investor, and best-selling author. Mark, thanks for being on the show. It's great to be here with you, Arusha. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the market, position sizing, and we will end the podcast with some current stocks. So let's get into the market. So a lot has changed since last week. We are officially in a correction, so we're waiting for a fall through day. But Mark, this wasn't necessarily a surprise to you that the market could pull back here. No, I think... Um you know, after such a V-shaped recovery and a, and a move that has been at a very torrid pace, uh, we've made a very, very good move off the lows. I think it surprised a lot of people the distance that it went uh, without much of a pullback. Uh, that's a typical lockout rally where everybody waits for the pullback and it never comes. Yes. Um, then finally, when you start to get the pullback, a lot of people disbelieve it and it go, usually goes a little further than most think. So it's sort of a classic situation for such a, a V recovery. Yeah. And uh, now what were some of the things that you were seeing uh, that were telling you that, okay, now we could be ready for a pullback? Yeah. So we were expecting a pullback uh, a few weeks ago. And the the reason was, well, lack of uh, a lot of stocks, of course, that were, were setting up. So I'm always looking at the individual stocks. If you don't see stocks setting up or worse if you see a lot of stocks that are extended that's always a uh, a bad sign for the market but um some of the things looking at the underlying conditions were one there's a, a lot of bullish sentiment so we had a lot of bullish sentiment uh put volume started coming way down there was uh, really no pessimism whatsoever in the market if you look at uh, whatever sentiment gauge, whether it's the Holbert Financial uh, Newsletter Survey or the Investor's Intelligence, all those numbers were at, at pretty lofty levels. And then the real thing was looking at, or, or sort of the, uh, you know, the, the axe, if you will, was uh, looking at the NASDAQ trading around new highs and the Qs actually making new highs. But if you looked at the percentage of stocks that were above their own 200-day moving average, it was less than 50% when the NASDAQ exchange was well above its 200-day moving average and flirting with all-time highs, that's usually a kiss of death in the short term. And now, does this necessarily mean that this is the the end of the, the rally at this point, or is it just more of a pullback? Well, what are your thoughts on that, just for kind of the longer-term part for the, the market, or at least this year? Right. Well, in the very long term, I, I think that the market's going substantially higher. Um, I think the conditions are, are really good for stocks going forward if we can, of course, maintain the type of conditions that we've had. And I think that's 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 likely. Um, of course, this is a secular bull market that's gone on for quite some time now. Right. And you're going to get cyclical corrections. We just had one, uh, whether you want to call it a bear market or correction pretty good uh, uh, correction that we just had in the market. So uh, I think pull, a pullback here is going to set up a really great buying opportunity. You may have to wait. You know, Maybe we go through the summer doldrums, as they call it, and sell in May and go away. No, not sure exactly, but uh, um, I, I think that we're going to have the better buying opportunity or the best buying opportunity has yet to come. Yeah, and, and a lot of, yeah, and, and it, it seems like more often than not, at least, it, it, it that you, the summers kind of take a break, you go through, let the bases set up again, and then you set up for a nice fall rally, at least for the our kind of stocks, these great growth stocks. Yeah, yeah, and that, that actually helped me uh, when I was in the U.S. Investing Championship in the 90s. I, that's where I made my big move was at the end of the year. I was uh, behind in the beginning of the year, and then uh, in the middle of the year, it, it, it got a little tougher, and I was able to hold in there. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, that's when uh, I was able to uh, make make my move and make uh, – and just to point out, too, the market itself, when you say the market, you don't necessarily have to have the indexes rip-roaring higher to be doing well in individual stocks. Sometimes 
it works just the opposite where you'll have the market will run up like it just did off the lows and you won't see a lot of participation on a broad scale basis maybe you know coming out of large bases and then as the market maybe comes out of a larger base and doesn't have as as fast of a move you start seeing participation and you get a lot of stocks that set up and you and and you can make a lot of money in the individual stocks but the indexes maybe don't have the same kind of uh, uh, progress yeah and and so before we we start recording here we were talking about the russell right so that that's one of the indexes that you're taking a look at um mm -hmm. to start to gain, gain some momentum going to new highs yeah i think you know, if you look at the Russell 2000, you look at the value line geometric, and if you look at the New York Stock Exchange composite, you're going to see a different picture than if you look at the Dow, the S&P, or even the NASDAQ at this point. So which one is correct? Well, I don't really make my determination on an index per se. I'm looking at the individual stocks. But when I look at the type of activity that's been taking place with individual stocks, you know, the software group has been really hot and it and, and that's a, a group move that's taking place. But I'm not seeing a lot of group activity. I'm not seeing a really broad rally here. So I'm thinking that we need to get the Russell to get above those recent highs. It tried to poke its head out a few weeks back only to be turned away and correct here. But if you look at the long term moving averages too, like the 200 day moving average of the Russell and you look at uh, you know the the, uh, uh, the price action, you'll see it just forming this big bottom or this big base um, and it needs to come up that right side. When you see those indexes break out and you get that participation in the small and mid cap area as well. Um, and the value line is more representative of what you might be feeling in your own account because it's an equally weighted index, contains a lot of small and mid-cap names, and you see a proliferation of names setting up, that's when the real, the best buying opportunity is going to uh, uh, emerge for uh, investors, for Canslam investors and investors that are you know, using the type of strategies that we, we, we employ, breakout yeah. strategies. And I well. think it's awesome for all listeners to hear that the best buying opportunity has yet to come. If if the if this uh, if these stocks are able to set up if this pullback is doesn't take too much time off, uh, you're going to have a lot of new exciting opportunities and maybe a, a more of a, a broad based rally. Uh, now, yeah. when we were talking about uh, let, let's go into a little bit of the the history of the GDP or just really the history of the markets, you know, back starting in the 70s and how it how it's changed over the years. Why don't you go into a little bit of that? Yeah, well, the, nothing's really changed in the market, but what I've noticed um, that there's 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 a particular condition that is taking place and has is been in force since the 1980s. Uh, if you look going back prior to the 1980s, you'll see the very wide swings in real GDP or or, the, or even GDP. Real, I look at real GDP. You'll see these wide swings in the economy where similar to what you'd see maybe in China now because it's a newer economy and you're going to have you know those periods of very strong growth but that's that creates a lot of volatility it creates uh, wide swings uh, in the uh, in the economic cycles um, now post 1980 85 uh, the, the the government the Fed has maybe gotten better at flattening the boom and bust cycle. Maybe we just matured as an economy. But you'll see that these prolonged periods, we've had a lot of very long, prolonged bull markets. It's very long, sustained bull markets. Wonderful times for stock investors. Those coincide with periods of stable, moderate growth in the economy. So they, they call it the Goldilocks scenario, where it's mm -hmm. not too hot, not too cold. And the disturbance of that is what creates bear markets. And we haven't seen a disturbance to the upside, where we've, where, and that's what the big fear is, inflation, but we haven't seen inflation since the 70s. Yeah. At some point, that might happen, but what normally happens is the you know we get a little hot in the economy, and the Fed comes in, raises rates, and it cools off. We go into recession. Uh, we get these bear markets, and, um, and then we recover. So that condition is still, if you look at real GDP, you'll see uh, we're still in that moderate, you know, 3% growth area. And if we were to run up and, you know, six, 7% growth, that would be a problem yes. uh, because the Fed would have to r raise rates very uh, aggressively. And that would, we, they would engineer a bear market or we'll end up rolling over into a bear market organically. And then the opposite will happen. They'll lower rates and they'll defend the, uh, uh, the economy. And that's what's been taking place. 
So well, let's take a quick break here. And to recap, the market is in a correction right now. So we're waiting for that falter data to, kind of, to give us the, the go ahead to move more aggressively in the market. But here's the thing. Keep those watch lists fresh to take advantage of leading stocks that could be pulling back to key support areas. When we return, we're going to talk about position sizing. Now, this is a question that Mark hears all the time. And imagine being completely right on a stock, but not truly profiting on the move. And the difference a lot of times is position sizing. So stay tuned. We'll be back. Hey, guys. Arusha from Investing with IBD here. The global economic cycle is moving into its later stages, creating a less favorable mix of growth and inflation. Central banks aren't providing as much fuel to keep things moving either. And market volatility has come back in a big way. All of this makes investing a lot more challenging today. Alliance Bernstein can help. AB is a global investment manager with the tools and expertise to get portfolios ready for a more difficult path ahead. That means finding stocks from companies that are able to deliver quality growth over time. Adding downside protection against market downturns is critical too. And even though interest rates are rising, investors shouldn't avoid duration in their fixed income exposure. The bottom line, investments will have to work harder to generate long-term returns, but that shouldn't mean that investors have to struggle to find answers. AB offers actively managed flexible investment solutions across asset classes. It's what you need to adapt your portfolio for late cycle investing. To find out more, visit abfunds.com. We're back with Mark Minervini on investing with IBD. And so, Mark, let's get into position sizing. And now, you know, I, I know you've heard these questions a lot. We hear them a lot here. But I'll throw out the first question here with, with position sizing here. How many positions should you have in a portfolio? Right. So, you know, I try to get pretty concentrated, but I'm trying to get as much money as I can into a small handful of names, but that doesn't mean that I necessarily go right to those big positions. So my, my largest position is going to be 20 or 25 percent, which that's a pretty big position. Right. You know, back in the day when I first started doing this and I had a very small account, I had my whole account in just, you know, two names, four names, full margin. I was uh, sometimes I'd even put my whole account in one name, wow. um, which, of course, uh, I wouldn't recommend. But uh, as far as position size is concerned, the key is that you don't want to be too diversified, all right? It's it's probably worse to be overly diversified than to be overly concentrated because if you're widely diversified, you know, you're 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 not going to make any return. Um you're not going to get super performance, you're not going to get the returns. I know some of the people that are listening to this, they've maybe read my book and they see some of the returns, you know, I've gotten in the past. I got those returns by being fairly concentrated. So th my general guidelines are not more than about maybe eight to 12 positions. You don't, you don't need to have much more than that. If you're running you know, a very large account, maybe uh, 12 to 15 positions. And that would include partial positions because you might sell half a position. Um, maybe you get stopped out of some, you scale back on some. So you'll have these partial positions. So you might have maybe 10 or 12 positions, but you're going to have some core positions too that you're you're, you're, you're force feeding some money to and maybe have been doing well and have grown and they're going to be the larger position. So in, in the in the better names, I, I want to have four or five of those names. Yeah. And so for the partial positions, a lot of times you might start off with like a 10 percent position or that that's what you're referring to, right? Kind of your, your partial position or could it be lower yeah, than well, that? Or? Well, maybe you start off with a large position, like a 20 percent position, yeah. and now it runs up and maybe the stock's up 20, 25 percent and you sell half of it. Okay. Now you've got a half position. Maybe it runs up some more. You sell another half of it. You know, now you've got you've got a 5 percent position. So you may end up with some stragglers like that that are your from your profits or maybe you've set a staggered stop and you've got stopped at a half the position now. So you'll, you're going to have s some smaller positions just simply by either – getting stopped out or taking some profits because, uh, you know, investing and trading stocks isn't an on or off business. It's a business of, of incremental movements. Um, you don't have to make a, a, an on or off decision. And, and so let's get into like also how you work up to that position. Is it always starting off with that 20% position or are there times where you may just work up to that 20% position? So I have a few basic guidelines for uh, not only position sizing, but with as far as exposure, portfolio exposure, uh, people, you know, generally think that I'm I'm using leverage and I'm highly exposed in the market. But on average, I'm only in the market about 
50% of the time and about 50% uh, invested. That's on average. There's times where I'm very aggressive, of course, but over time, if you were to average it all out, uh, I'm only invested about 50%. So my guidelines are, first of all, I never go more than 25 to 50% exposure, overall exposure, until I've got some positions that are working. So say I'm in cash, like recently we've had this uh, pullback in the market or this this bear market that we just had. Uh, I was forced into cash. So when I bring that money back into the market, even if I see a lot of setups, I'm not just going right in and buying everything and going 100% invested. I might take uh, two or three or four positions, and they're probably going to be smaller, like 5%, 10% positions. If those start working, then I'll start raising and 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 adding positions and adding size, maybe the next position's 15 or 20%, and and then I'll start uh, using force displacement uh, to uh, you know force feed some of those uh, some of those better names. Okay, and and so you're you're listening to the market, you're letting the market prove itself before you start moving more and more. Yes, and and it and the exact same thing in reverse. So if those trades aren't working out. Let's say I scale myself up and the trades aren't working out. I start bringing back my exposure. Now, you know, some people try that and then they scale up and then the market comes in and then they scale down and the market turns up and they go, oh, well, I, I, I should have never listened to Mark Maravini. Every time I bring it up, the market goes down. I should have been buying when the market was down. OK, that may work. It may work where the market comes in and you load up. But at some point, what's going to happen is you're going to sell into a short term rally and miss a bull market, and you're gonna buy into a short-term pullback that turns into a bear market, and you're gonna end up in, in a lot of trouble. So it's a bad habit to get into, but you know, there's some noise in between that you're gonna to have, to, you're going to have to live with. But here's the, here's the key. If you scale up when you're trading, when things are working, you're guaranteed to be trading your largest when you're trading your best. When you scale down when things are not working, you're guaranteed to be trading at your smallest when you're trading your worst. So you're going to you're going to pyramid yourself into a big invested position in a bull market and you're going to scale out into a bear market and and this is one of the reasons why I have not been scathed in a bear market in 30 years. Um, and, and I've been and I've taken participation in every bull market. Yeah, and, and so yeah, you're just going with the trend. All right, there and letting the market give you feedback and and really you know proving itself before you put more and more hard uh, of of your hard earned money to work in, because as we know these markets can turn so fast and take all those gains and even uh, principal back so quickly. Um, yeah, I, okay. just real quick, that's just a, that's just something I learned from O'Neill many many years ago, and he made a he made a statement that I use all the time now. If the stock is so good, why isn't it going up? Yes, if, yes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's that it's that simple, right? Yes. You, you just have to listen to the market. You know, you're not smarter than the market. You know, the market is always right, and, and those are things that you know we here have have heard from O'Neill many, many times. Uh, now let's get into the guidelines because I think you know the, the the first part is position sizing, but it's also risk management from a portfolio level. And uh, so let's go into some of your guidelines of how you look at it from a, a broader perspective on your portfolio. Right. So with position sizing, you have to always think about your position sizing and your stop loss in relation to what you're risking of your total equity of your account. So very simple. If you were to take a 10 percent position and you had a 10 percent stop on that position, that would mean that you're risking one percent of the total equity of your account. Right. You'd be risking right. if you had one hundred thousand dollars and you take a 10 percent position, ten thousand dollars, 10 percent stop is a thousand bucks. Thousand yep. dollars into the hundred thousand is one percent. So what's what are the guidelines to that? If you have that number, that that risk of total equity, if it's too small, if you're risking point zero five percent of total equity, you're never going to make any return because you don't have a big enough you know bet size on the line. And if it's too big then you have a very uh, uh, good chance of having a big setback if you have a streak of losers. That's what is referred to as the risk of ruin. So where's the balance? The balance for most traders, if, particularly if you're just starting out, you don't want to be much more than about 1 to 1.25% of total equity. So again, that would just simply uh, it mean if you were to uh, have a uh, – maybe you had a big position, a 25% position, right? So if you were to take a 10% stop on a 25% position, 
that means that you're risking 2.5% of total equity. Mm -hmm. That's too much. That's too much. So if you're going to take that type of position, then you need to back into a, a tighter stop. So a 5% stop now would give you a 1.25% of total equity. And uh, one, one thing, and, and this reminded me, as, as you're going through all these kind of scenario analysis and, and setups and just thinking way ahead of the game here, uh, your, the, the strategy and when, when you look, when you read your books, especially the second book that you released, it's very mathematical. Right. Yeah. Everything yep. is just laid out there and then it just becomes a number game. That That's what really stuck out to me when I went through your second book. Right. Well, that that's the beauty about stock trading is that you have a, a, a part of it that's extremely quantifiable and there's a there's math to it. And then there's the art portion of it. There's the chart reading. There's there, and not everything is black and white. You know, thank God if it was computers would do everything. You just hit a button and then there would all the opportunity and all the alpha would be wrung out of the market and there'd be no there would be no opportunity. Yeah. The reason why there's an opportunity is because it's not pure science, but you can use math and science to eliminate a lot of the risk and and to quantify a lot of things. The risk is one of them. The risk really there shouldn't be any gray areas when it comes to risk. That's the one thing that you have complete control over. You go into a, into a position, you buy a stock, you have no idea whether it's going to go up or not. That's in the hands of the stock gods, right? right so, right. But, but you can't control how much you buy. You can't control when you buy. You can control when you sell, and you can control precisely how much uh, you accept for a loss. So those are the things that you want to really concentrate on. Now, one last thing here, and uh, this was a really interesting point that when we were talking uh, before uh, Alpha and how you want your portfolio uncorrelated to the market. And even, even though sometimes your portfolio might be going sideways while the market is going up, why, why don't you talk a little bit more of that concept? Yeah. So and I learned about how investors are very attached to the indexes and what's going on in the environment. Uh, when I managed money for other uh, uh, other uh, clients many many years ago, and I realized that my style of capturing alpha of getting these big returns at the time I was getting these huge returns uh, even for my customers, and some of the customers were actually upset. They would because there was these long stretches that I would be doing nothing and the market would be going up. So they would call and say, Hey, what's going on here? You know, the the Dow's yeah. up 10% and you haven't made a dime. But they forget that I was up 60%, you know, the prior six months. Um, so I realized that we all tend to look at, you know, what's going on. You're watching the TV. And it, but what I also learned is that in order to capture alpha, you have to be – by definition, you have to be uncorrelated. So what will happen is – and it just happened recently. As this market ran up here, I'm not up much. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not up at all during this most recent uh, uh, move up here. Um, I'm actually about flat in my account. Um, I, ha I had some profits, and I got stopped out of a bunch of names, and I sort of been jockeying for position. So – but that doesn't bother me at all mm -hmm. because I realized that – if you're moving up when the market's moving up, down when the market's moving down, sideways when the market's moving sideways, well, then you probably have a whole bunch of names in your account that are stock uh, uh, stock index type names. You're, you're just mimicking the indexes, and I can assure you that at the end of the day, your performance is going to be about what the indexes are doing because you're you're mimicking them. So to capture alpha, you've got to uncorrelate. It's very hard for people to do that because uh, sometimes, like I said, you might see this market uh, move sideways for a while, and that might be my best period in my in my portfolio. And then there's other periods where the market runs up, and I'm sitting in cash the whole time, and I can't find anything to buy. Uh, so you got to get used to being uncorrelated with the market if you want to uh, get big, get good returns. Proper precision sizing can make all the difference in the world to your portfolio. And, and as you've heard here, you just got a really uh, nice little snapshot here. You know, it's discipline and knowing, knowing what works for you. After the break, uh, we're going to discuss some current stocks that are on Mark's radar. So stay tuned. Want to find stocks like the ones on this podcast? A lot of the best names we talk about come from IBD's exclusive stock lists, like the IBD 50 and the Big Cap 20. Whatever type of investor you are, we got a list for you. You can access every one of IBD's lists, plus stock ratings, exclusive analysis, and one-on-one -on -one coaching with a membership to IBD Digital. It costs less than a dollar a day, 
But for podcast listeners, we're offering an even better price. Go to Investors.com slash podcast offer right now and get your first two months for only $20. We're back with Mark Minervini, and let's go into some current stocks here. And I think the first question that a lot of listeners have, especially after the second segment, is how do you find stocks that are uncorrelated to the market? How do you generate that alpha? Yeah, so um, I'm looking for stocks that usually are already showing a lot of strength. And by definition, they're continuation moves they're not I'm not looking to buy the low of, of a you know of, of a name um, or the market so uh, I'm looking for continuation moves and no different than you're gonna find in O'Neill's book or my books mm -hmm. um, I'm doing nothing different than you know everything that I that I write about um, so uh, looking for stocks that are coming out of well-formed bases uh, that are showing uh, good relative strength and uh, Hopefully, it's got the earnings and sales, too. Sometimes with biotech names, you won't have the earnings there or the sales. Uh, about 75% of biotechs don't have earnings, um, so you have to trade off the chart. But optimally, your better, your better situations are going to have the earnings and the sales on the table. So uh, looking for the stock to be hitting on all cylinders. Yep. And so let's go into our first uh, example here and, and one of the first stocks that's on your watch list. And... Uh, it's Qualcomm. Now, this, this is a stock that I own, and, and Mark, I think you, you might own it too. I'm not sure. But um, yeah. let's let's go in, into this. And this one is, is an interesting one because they don't have the great earnings right now, but there was uh, a fundamental kind of catalyst that happened recently with Qualcomm when they settled their dispute with Apple uh, for the tune of around $4.5 billion. And now they have a, a patent license with Apple uh, to help produce... Uh, the 5G chips for their new phones that are coming up in the next couple of years. Yeah, so if you take a look, you know, at the chart of Qualcomm, the fact that the stock ran up almost 100% in a very short period of time, especially with a big cap name like this, that's a that's a huge move. It takes a lot of buying to move a stock like that. Yeah. And the fact that you look at the relative strength, it's a 98 relative strength. So it's in the top 2%, which is the, you know, the, the, that's the elite. That's the what I call aces and kings, um, it, giving a poker analogy. Yeah, like <laughs> so and, and, and the fact that after that move, as the market corrects here, the stocks only come back about nine or ten percent. Uh, the pullback has been very shallow. So to me, this is showing incredible strength. And even if there wasn't a, a deal on the table or earnings uh, on the table, I would still be looking at this because the, it's so powerful and it's showing so much strength. Uh, there's times where I call it relative prioritizing, where certain things are more important than others. So, for instance, with a biotech company, you know, the earnings aren't ge generally a, a total factor for me because I realize that it's trading on the FDA approval process and so forth. So I'm trading off of the chart the relative strength. So those are more important factors um, with this type of situation. The earnings are not there, but if you take a look, you'll see that going back for quite a while, the earnings of Qualcomm were stuck in a range between three dollars and about seventy cents or so to somewhere in the neighborhood of you know high fours, maybe five dollars. Now, mm -hmm. this 2020 estimates are for 531. That's a breakout year, not a big breakout, but then again, that's just an estimate. If they start producing, you're going to see those estimates go up. So a, bre a breakout um, so, on so the I, earnings. Just, yeah, just I, to, I think yeah. that uh, this stock looks pretty powerful. I actually own it here. Okay. So, so yeah, so this one, it, it's acting well during this recent pullback. It, it has absorbed it, especially after that really, really strong move there. Uh, let's go into our second stock, uh, T-Mobile, ticker symbol T-M-U-S. And uh, Mark, what do you like about this one? So t these are these are big cap names too. They're t kind of uncharacteristic of what I'm I'm normally where I'm normally trafficking. But this just goes to show you again how there's not a whole lot of stock ideas right now. So I'm I'm gravitating to some of the names that are, you know the, the few names that are setting up. But T-Mobile, you know, had this is an industry that has re regulation and recently had. There were some hiccups in the stock. If you go back in April or uh, late March or, or April, you saw the stock sold off, but then it rallied back. That was due to uh, uh, some regulatory uh, uh, grumblings, if you will. But the stock has held up 
really well while the market's correcting. And this is a market type name. This is a, a name that really should be sort of fluctuating with the with the uh, uh, the Dow or, or the or the Nasdaq. So. But it's holding up very tight here. If you look, it's got very good earnings and good estimates going forward. Uh, so this is one I actually bought a uh, few days back. And uh, it, it, I have a pretty tight stop on it. But so far, it's holding up, even with the market correcting here. So if it can get to new highs here, uh, I'd be pretty uh, uh, impressed here. And I, I think uh, you could buy it if it breaks out to new highs. Yeah, and, and this was a stock that formed a flat base back in April, broke out, and then form kind of a, a smaller, tighter range, and then so it just keeps slowly being accumulated. And uh, yeah, today's reaction uh, was uh, pretty good and very, very close to new highs. So let's go to our third stock here, and this is uh, I3 Verticals, and uh, ticker symbol IIIV, and uh, a much smaller stock, but uh, they're they're slowly setting up. Yeah, this doesn't trade a whole lot of volume. It only trades about 60,000 to 100,000 shares a day. So it's it's definitely much more speculative. This is actually more of the the type of stock I normally traffic in, a smaller type name that's underfollowed, especially if it's an IPO within the last year or two. I love those newer names. Um, so this one here, though, I, I would I would not enter this unless it got above this 25 area um, and broke out of this recent uh, sideways movement. Uh, now, you had earnings that just recently came out. It held up with the earnings. It didn't mm -hmm. break down, so that's good. And it's holding up pretty tight with the uh, with the market coming in here. It didn't participate today. Yeah, we had a, we had a, a good day today and yesterday. But again, like I said, the, the high alpha names or the names that you're going to be trafficking in, you know, might be bucking the trend at times. So you know, focus on the stock here. But if this stock breaks out from here, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm going to be buying it. Now, for 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 a stock like this where it is a smaller, it's, it's more thinly traded. Do you adjust your position sizing here and go a little bit smaller just because it? moves a lot faster and might be hard to get off if something uh, if it went against you yes people ask me that all the time they assume because i've been successful in stocks that i'm trading a lot of money and i'm taking big positions well yes when i can okay so if, if the stock's trading you know fifty thousand shares a day i'm certainly not going to go buy twenty five thousand shares <laughs> um so so i i'm going to take whatever i feel i can get in safely and get out safely and you know even if it's a, a, a very small position i'd rather have a small position in a stock that doubles than a big position in a big cap name that maybe goes nowhere no i mean that that does make sense here uh let's go into the fourth stock here and uh ticker symbol is boom uh b-o-o-m d-m-c global and uh this this might be a power play right this is a power play, yeah, or what uh, could be called a high tight flag. Um, again, 99 relative strength. You, you've, you're hitting on all cylinders here. You've got sales, you've got earnings, you've got the top relative strength ranking, relative uh, relative strength line, new highs, coming out of a base, holding up while the market's correcting. So it's really a perfect scenario. Now that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work. I have a stop uh, set here, but uh, I I bought it today. So coming out here, I, I I'm not. I'm not very large in any of my positions right now. Mm -hmm. um, taking small positions right now, but I did take uh, did buy some of this today. And one final stock uh, ticker symbol is BSTC, and uh, so we were talking about biotechs earlier, uh, bio specifics technologies. This one, but this one's a little unusual, Mark. This one actually has some earnings. Yeah, the last quarter was only up 11% and, and the sales decelerated a bit. So I, I would have liked to have seen a better quarter. But one quarter, uh, I'll give it some slack. It's got uh, some really good earnings here. And like I said before, most biotechs don't have earnings. So you're getting a biotech with earnings. This still looks like it has a little bit of work to do and maybe needs to tighten up here in this base. But I would watch it if it can stay tight and the volume could come in and it can quiet down here. I would then watch for it to move through the 70 level. And that would be your buy point. And this reminds me, you know, of Amgen back in the 90s when it was one of the few biotechs that had earnings. So uh, whenever I see a, a biotech and it, it's got uh, it's got the earnings as well, you know, I'm, I'm going to watch it carefully. And if I can get a buy point, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. And and with Amgen, it, that was one of those stocks that you were able to participate, right, back, back in the early 90s? 
that was one of your. Oh yeah, priorities. yeah. Amgen was a big winner for me. You know, and back then there was a uh, it was a group move. It was sort of like what you ha like what you have now with the software stocks, where yeah. the market uh, corrected uh, in 1990, and you had this particular area of the market. Well, there's a few areas actually, three or four areas that were holding up against the market, and those were the uh, in the medical area, the uh, biotechs, and the uh, and the computer computer peripheral software. So now we've got that happening. You see in the um, in the software area where you have symbol N O W Z S, some of these names that are holding up quite well, and that's uh, sort of the group that uh, one of the groups I'm focusing on also in this in this uh, most recent move. Yeah, and and this was a, a good example of how this has still been a, a little bit more of a narrow type of rally. As in, it's not as broad based as ideally what we'd hope for, but you know if we get through this correction, if we take the summer off, build new bases, the Russell goes into new highs, then we could have more of a broad based rally, and hopefully that the the best buying opportunities will start to appear over the next few months. Okay, thanks, Marks, for joining us on the episode today. Well, thanks for having me. It's been uh, it's been fun, and I hope it's been helpful for everyone. That's it for this week on Investing with IBD. Now, it's probably best to go back and listen to this episode a few times because Mark really introduced a number of concepts here and, and is really just sharing from experience. So I think going back and letting uh, going back, reviewing this and letting it absorb the material is going to be helpful for all of you investors out there. Now, next week, we're going to have Mark's friend, David Ryan, and he's also our friend, successful portfolio manager here in-house, a market wizard, and three-time U.S. investing champion. So we're excited to have that, and that's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.